at the atomic and subatomic level, there are no isolated parts. There, there is a network of relationships and the properties of any part of the network are determined by how uh, it is, they are connected to the other parts. So it's really this shift from objects to relationships, to patterns, to context, which uh, other people later on called systems thinking or systemic thinking, and, and which is what I mainly write about these days. <laughs>
uh, Green Politics, which is really meant to be kind of a German book um, for German politics, the, the, the Green Party, but uh, it's uh, very successful all around the world, belonging to the universe and eco management and many, many others. I have, the, I have a copy of the Systems View of Life book. This is kind of the course manual and a wonderful book and, and read. It's biblical proportions, but well worth it. And then the other one is uh, uh, the, the uh, Web of Life. And so as all my listeners know, I love to, to hold up books and kind of engage. Uh, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Mark, for this very kind and very extensive introduction. And, and let me say that regarding my new book, Patterns of Connection, uh, this is a collection of essays with a narrative that interweaves the essays and gives the historical and philosophical context. And it is really a, a, the story about how my thinking evolved over five decades. So in this narrative, I talk about all my books. So, so when, you, when you read this one, you get all the references because it's, it's really an account of my journey. Yeah, and that's why, one of the reasons why I really loved it because you can see that web of life almost through, through the entire book and it really touches out and, and the, the review that I give you on the book, which is, is a good, of course, it's so nice because it connects that web to not only historical learning, but other science and other books and other things that were pivotal all, also in your journey. But you also have the very great fortune, uh, I would say, that on this journey that you made, you met incredible people. And if uh, I would, uh, in the show links and then in the description, I will put a link to this to your website but you have on your website the Fritholf Capra colleagues and mentors that you've met over the year, right. years. Right. And, and it's kind of this, this web uh, with pictures and what they do, and you can scroll over them. Um, and I would recommend looking at that, the amazing people that you've come across and, and the learnings and the connections that you've made. And so I will definitely put a, put a really link to connected. it. It's connected to patterns of connection because uh, when, I, when I wrote the book, uh, I reviewed my entire career. And of course, I didn't exactly remember when I met whom and, and when certain conversations took place. So I had to do quite a bit of research in my notes and old calendars and things. And so I thought it would be good to put a conceptual map together of about 50 people who have really influenced my thinking. And that's what I published, I posted on my website. I, I absolutely love it. And I think that's a tool. And that's the one thing about all your works is you really provide the tools and the references and how, how some things come, come about with, with all of this. In I would say in the beginning of your book, and I don't want to give it away, I want you to really tell us and take us on this journey in some respects, but also only only tease it because I do want people to go out and get the book and, and, and read it for themselves, but just a, a, enough of an understanding of kind of the journey. And one of them is, is a book that I'm going to hold up now. This is probably not the edition that you have, Physics and Philosophy by Werner Heisenberger. And um, I'm sure you have many books. You always have let them me, behind you. Let me just go behind me and show you. This is the actual book I read as a student in Vienna. It's a German paper, cheap German paperback called Physik und Philosophie. So Physics and Philosophy is a, a now classic book by Werner Heisenberg, uh, one of the founders of quantum theory. And in this book, Heisenberg gives a very vivid account of the challenges a handful of European physicists were facing 
at the beginning of the 20th century during the first three decades when they were able for the first time to do experiments involving atoms and subatomic particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, and so on. And what they found was totally shocking to them because they, they could not use the classical concepts, the concepts of classical physics, like energy, momentum, position, uh, and so on, to describe the, the phenomena they were observing. So uh, they were deeply challenged and they had to change their whole language, their concepts, uh, their entire worldview. And uh, basically what the change was, was just to sort of go come to the punchline, um, the change was that at the atomic and subatomic level, there are no isolated parts. There, there is a network of relationships and the properties of any part of the network are determined by how uh, it is, they are connected to the other parts. So it's really this shift from objects to relationships, to patterns, to context, which uh, other people later on called systems thinking or systemic thinking, and, and which is what I mainly write about these days. But this is what happened in quantum physics, and it was absolutely shocking to them. And they, they overcame this shock and were rewarded with deep insights into the nature of, of matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I read this book in the late 50s as a young student, and in part, it's quite technical. So I understood only about half of it. But uh, this book accompanied, accompanied me through my career, and I went back to it again and again. And uh, looking back now on these five decades, I can say that Heisenberg's book really determined my entire career as a scientist and writer. Because Heisenberg, what he said in the book at one particular passage is that the mechanistic worldview is deeply ingrained in our minds and in our educational system. And it will take us a long time to overcome it and have a really different view about reality. And that, that sentence became sort of programmatic for my life. That's what I have done all my life, investigate the change of paradigms from the mechanistic to the systemic, holistic, or ecological paradigm, the philosophical consequences, the social and political consequences, and so on. So Heisenberg was one of the key people, and I was fortunate to meet him. Uh, I met him twice, once uh, when I just began to write the Tao of Physics in the, in the early 70s, and once when the manuscript was finished, just before I published the book, when I showed him the whole manuscript. And those were very inspiring meetings. Yeah, I heard he, he gave you some, some nice feedback. And also, um, you later found some, some actual, I don't quotes, not the right word, but that he'd also documentation, documentation about certain things, which is amazing. Um, uh, in the first I, meeting in, in 1972, Heisenberg told me that he was actually well aware of the connections between the views of modern physics and the views of Eastern philosophy. And he was aware of that because he had been to India and he had been the guest of one of the greatest Indian sages, Rabindranath Tagore, poet, philosopher, and mystic of India. And so he had long discussions with Tagore about modern physics and Eastern philosophy. And he said that that helped him a lot, you know, because I remember him saying, he said, what I was doing in quantum physics, all of a sudden didn't seem all that crazy. Because, you know, those physicists were out on a limb, you know, alone and get going into really new territory. And so Heisenberg found a, a kind of confirmation. And then in the, in the second meeting, 
which was probably in 1974, something like that, or 75, just before the book came out. I went through the whole manuscript with him, you know, chapter by chapter and summarized wow. uh, the whole manuscript. And he just looked at me at the end and said, you know, basically, I completely agree with you. And to me, to, you know, a young writer starting out oh, as yeah. a career, that was, of course, fantastic. That was absolutely fantastic. I can imagine, I almost feel how you feel. In, in many respects, I, ha I, I ha have that awe and that nervousness when I'm around you as well, because I see you as a mentor. And I, I want to tell you in a couple of ways, not only am I alumni of your Capra course, which set, set me off on a whole different path and journey on what I do in climate activism and in, in, in environmental um, ecological economics and in the direction of how I speak and see the world and, and try to influence it as an activist in, in many ways. But you're also a very strong influence who also uh, brought to light the knowledge of Lynn Margulis. And, uh, for me, and um, I, I'm an avid student of uh, of her books and her her readings. I have some that I, that I've put here as well, and so I really want to thank you for that as well. I want to back she, up. She's one yeah. of my big science heroes, you know, Lynn Margulis. I met her several times. I had long discussions with her. And uh, her her book that she wrote with her son Dorian Sagan, uh microcosmos uh right there microcosmos really my thinking you know it's really what i now call the systems view of evolution symbiotic planet and also acquiring genomes and i don't know mark whether you know that there is a beautiful documentary film about her i i have it it's a, a symbiotic a earth Man. yep i have it symbiotic and earth it's fabulous you're in it it's called symbiotic earth yeah. and, and i'm in it in the film together with many other scientists but it's beautifully made it's absolutely it's made from bullfrog films and i i have i actually have two copies here i, I was already living in germany at the time and so i had them sent and i tell you it was the longest wait to get them and when i did i i i watched them and i also share them because they're on dvd let me, let with me other just, people uh, mention one thing that that is typical of Lynn Margulis. Um, when you talk about the nature of biological life and the difference between a living organism and a non-living system, like what's the essential difference between a plant and a rock or an animal and, and a rock? And, you know, scientists debate and they go into DNA, RNA, proteins, cells, and, and so on. And Lynn Margulis sort of cut through this uh, by focusing on metabolism. Metabolism is that flow of energy and matter, the flow of food, essentially, that we all need to stay alive. And uh, it's a constant flow of energy and matter through a network of uh, chemical processes that allows uh, a living organism to maintain itself, to, to evolve, to develop, and so on. So this is well known. Metabolism is a, a well yeah. known phenomenon. So Lynn Margulis says, if it metabolizes, it's alive. If it doesn't, it's not. I mean, this is so clear, you know? Yes. And, and of course, to really understand it, to go into the details and understand metabolism, you know, it's a lot of work and evolves a lot of concepts. But she just said, if it metabolizes, it's alive. If, if not, it's not alive. Since we're on the topic, I, I, I want to ask you and see if you, you have anything else you would like to share from um, kind of from your learnings from Lynn. Um, she was... <laughs> A rebel's not the right word, but she kind of uh, put well, the whole science. It's a good word, I think. Yeah. Okay. She, she she had a rebellious nature, and for instance, she said that you know evolution was one of her big subjects. She was a microbiologist, and the role of bacteria and other microorganisms in evolution was her big subject. 
And she said that most biologists and evolutionary theorists get the phenomenon of, phenomenon of evolution wrong because they are zoologists. All they talk about is, is animals. They don't know anything about microorganisms. Now that's a little exaggerate, but you know, she was very strong on that and, and said, if you don't understand the contribution of microorganisms to life, which is how it started, of course, because yeah. the first two billion years, there was nothing else. There were only microorganisms. So that's what she calls the microcosmos. So that's one of her great contributions. Yeah, and I, I, it's also, I mean, she, she really put the entire scientific community on its head in, in some respects. I also think there was um, a, 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 something that I, that I noticed, and I don't know how well I understood it, is that she also said, you know, it's not <clears throat> natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. She said, everything in our wor world works in symbiosis and symbiogenesis and that it's a collaboration and cooperation one organism to another one animal to another one species to another absolutely she said she said independence is not a scientific term it's a political term yeah for for her the universe was always interconnected and and she is not the author, but the main developer and promoter of the theory of symbiogenesis, which means that symbiosis is a well understood phenomenon where two organisms live in close connection and mutual dependence. And uh, what happened in evolution in the past was that uh, larger microorganisms often feed on smaller ones like you know the large microorganisms would ingest small bacteria and of course these small bacteria would then be digested and would die but sometimes they didn't die sometimes they continue to live inside the larger organisms and develop a mutually beneficial relationship thus creating a new species and that's what she called symbiogenesis the the creation of uh, a new species via symbiosis and so so today and that's also her summary whereas the the neo darwinist theory of evolution knows only about random mutations chance genetic changes and subsequent natural selection now we know about three avenues of evolution. Uh, genetic change is still one, but then bacteria continually ingest DNA from other bacteria, you know, spit it out, spit out yeah. genetic materials and, in, and ingest it. And again, uh, to quote Lynn, one of her characteris characteristic statements, she says, it is as if you jumped into a swimming pool with brown eyes and came out with blue eyes. Because wow, that's in, in, in the water you have ingested the ge genetic material. So, so that's the second avenue, which, uh, which is called uh, uh, transverse uh, horizontal gene transfer, technically. So the, the, the trading of genes, that's how she calls it, gene trading. And the second is her own theory of symbiogenesis, evolution through sym symbi symbiosis. <clears throat> and and what, is, what I emphasize when I talk about evolution is that even though these processes contain random elements, a lot of random elements, the overall process is complex and very ordered because in these in this creation of genetic novelty through these three avenues not all results are viable and the results need to be always integrated into the larger genetic and cellular environment and i spent hours with lynn where she explain to me the technicalities of how this integration takes place very complex processes and only a few solutions remain 
That's how natural selection works. And that is a highly ordered process. So evolution, the overall process of evolution is highly ordered. Yeah, the, the, the last mm -hmm. thing that I'll say about Lynn too, that, that I've observed is she wasn't always behind the microscope or behind the book or the, the lectern. She was actually out in nature and, and with the microorganisms mm -hmm. and jumping in the swamps and in the lakes and in right. the places and, and doing a lot of connection to nature. Um, yeah. it, and in the film, this is beautifully pictured. Yeah. John had yeah. footage of her, you know, where she reaches into the muck and pulls out some tissues and gets all excited and says, look here what we have. This is copper and this is this and this is this. And she was very excited. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm sad we lost her so early. There's yeah. so much we could talk about her, but that's really just one, one uh, facet of your big journey. Uh, uh, and I, I want to back up just a, just a little bit. So for, for the listeners who don't know, you spent 12 years of your life in Vienna, Austria, then moved with your mother and father and your, your brother to um, uh, Innsbruck, Austria, and ended up uh, getting your PhD in physics. Uh, yeah, you could say the first 12 years I spent on the farm. I grew yeah. up on a farm. That, that was a very, very formative uh, period, my early childhood. Be, okay, because uh, of the connection to to, to nature, you know, to intimate nature. connection to nature. Yes. Yeah, and then and then you moved to Innsbruck, and that's why the German. That's why the German books for for those. But you you've had a, a, a pretty big journey. Now you're in Berkeley, California, in the United States. I'm in Hamburg, Germany, and to to back it up and to kind of ease people into the patterns, uh, 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 your book. Uh, patterns of connection. I, I want one, it's 50 years of essays and work and, and research that you've done and writing that you've done. But this past almost two years has kind of been a crazy time. Not only did we do the pandemic, we did Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, a crazy inauguration. We've had a lot of crazy things. I want to know does all your teachings, does all these lessons, all these connections, did they help you kind of weather this crazy time a little bit better? And how have you been? And how did you get to, to, to Berkeley from, from Germany? And, uh, you know, uh, take us on that trip and then to the book. Well, uh, I uh, got my PhD in Vienna and uh fell in love with a French woman and moved to Paris uh, and spent two years in Paris at the University of Paris. That was my first postdoctoral work. And it happened to be in uh, 67 and 68. And in 68 was this big student revolution, student revolt in Paris, which is still known in Europe as May 68, simply. And I was in the very midst of it and, and, and that influenced my thinking in terms of social change and, and activist movements and so on. So, so then I moved to California. Uh, I moved to California because I met the, an American physicist in Paris, uh, Michael Naudenberg, who, who was doing physics here at the University of California. I started working with him and he got me the job in Santa Cruz, California at the university. Wow. Uh, then I, I spent two years there, very much involved in the whole hippie culture, the counterculture. Uh, uh, this is where I studied Eastern philosophy. I experimented with psychedelics. I, I practiced meditation. I did all of that, the full 60s. And in, in addition to being a physicist in my day job, so I had a sort of rather schizophrenic life at the time, I then moved back to Europe, spent four years in London, and that's when I wrote the Tao of Physics. And then when the book was finished, I moved back to California. 
And again, this was a physicist who became a strong mentor, Jeffrey Chu at Berkeley. And I spent 10 years working with him very closely from about 75 to 85. And at that time, after the tremendous success of the Tao physics, I got invited to a lot of lectures and seminars and I met people from all walks of life who told me that a similar change of paradigms than the one I had described in physics in the book, the Tao of Physics, was happening in other fields. So I became interested in other areas, in biology, in medicine, in psychology, in economics, and so on. And I wrote the book eventually about these changes. Uh, the book is called The Turning Point, was published in 1982. And uh, during that period, uh, two things happened. One was that I slowly transitioned from being a working physicist to a science writer. And two, that I recognized that the various issues I was now becoming interested in, like health, the environment, social justice, the management of organization, organizations and so on, that these all had to do with life, with individual organisms, social systems and ecosystems. And so physics has nothing to say about living systems. And so my interest shifted from physics to the life sciences, um, to ecology, uh, theory of living systems, later on complexity theory. And uh, in the mid eighties, I gave up physics altogether and, and worked in the life sciences and wrote books about this emerging a new understanding of life, which I call the systems view of life. And I spent 30 years developing a synthesis of this systems view of life. And it, it's really a, a complete work that goes through from beginning to end out of all the different sciences. And um, I, I absolutely love the course. Um, it's uh, the book that we're talking about is really also a journey. And, and you, you talk about it just now that it's, you go from a physicist to a, a science writer, but there's this strong environmentalist or activist as well within yeah. you. And a lot of your work is that. Can you tell us a little bit how that well, developed? Yeah, I should, I should tell you that uh, the, one of the great formative periods in my life were the 1960s. And uh, the in the 1960s, this, the members of this counterculture, as it was later called, um, experienced two kinds of expansion of consciousness one into the spiritual realm, the religious, spiritual, or what psychologists later called the transpersonal dimension of consciousness. And the other one was an expansion of social consciousness. So there, the main uh, characteristic was a radical questioning of authority. So you had the civil rights movement in America, the protest against the Soviet regime in Prague. You had uh, psychologists questioning the authority of uh, therapists over patients or doctors. You had students in the various students movements questioning the authority of uh, the university professors when it comes to political questions. You had women questioning the authority of men of patriarchal society. So it was this broad questioning of authority. And in fact, I should tell you that uh, one of the first essays in Patterns of Connection is an essay about the 60s where I go into great detail. So, so this was my formative period. And um, in my work, after the 1960s, beginning in the 1970s, 
I first went into the spiritual direction and explored Eastern spiritual traditions and wrote the Tao of Physics. But the other side was, was always uh, with me. And I remember that uh, when I was in the process of writing the Tao of Physics, I remember exactly when it was in London, I was traveling on the London underground and I was reading a review of Schumacher's famous book, Small is Beautiful in the Guardian newspaper. And, and the review was titled Buddhist Economics. And so I thought, well, this is something I ought to get interested in, but I put it aside because I was in the middle of writing the Tao of Physics but I came back to the social issues afterwards. And uh, the turning point is, is a book, not only about a, a scientific paradigm shift, but also about social change. And from that time on, all my books have been about the paradigm shift in science and in society, intellectual change, conceptual change, and social change. Uh a lot of your your personal work as well as as helping people with you know the the, the big buzzword right now is re regeneration regenerative even paul hawken just came out with a new book called regeneration and you've been in 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 a couple of his books he's been talking about you since natural capitalism and, and um ec ecology um books as well which i have the ecology of a commerce and that he he speaks about you quite a bit but yeah and he, and, and the other way around too you know i yeah. i cite him in my work uh, paul hawken is an excellent writer he, he's yeah. really really is is he understands things from a systemic point of view he's a major activist and his style of writing is excellent i think the ecology of commerce is still one of his best books I do too. I really like that one a lot. And I, I've, I've recently reread all of them in preparation for his new book, Regeneration as well. And I, I just, so not only have you been around and doing this for a long time, but there is also this journey, this, this kind of the social, the activist part, uh, besides your very scientific connections and in, in the community of those thought leaders and the scientists who <clears throat> you kind of also brought together and had dialogues with. And in these 11 chapters of your book, you kind of not only talk about the ac activities uh, over these uh, five decades, uh, how much happened and, and that you realized in your life, but you kind of, um, you know, you went through the feminist movement, the green movement, the apartheid, and, and there's these different sections. And it's this nice journey that 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 shows that. Again, back to, to my question, I, I think I know the answer, but have those learnings, that journey and the and your writings proven to really be a better model for life, whether you call it a regenerative lifestyle or or a different uh, model for life or a different way of looking not just the systems view of life but you also structure those you surround yourself with and the way you live a little bit different to yeah well let me let me first tell you that uh since i have never been a pure theorist but always combined theory and conceptual insights with activism and the desire for social change uh, this book, Patterns of Connection, uh, is not only an account of my intellectual journey, but also an account of the various social movements that I encountered and became part of, from the counterculture of the 1960s to the New Age movement and of the 1970s, the feminist movement of the 1970s, then the movement of green politics in the 1980s, uh, the new thinking of Mikhail Gorbachev toward the end of the 80s and the great enthusiasm that we all felt around the world. Then in the 1990s, the information technology revolution and the sort of disappointment that 
the so-called peace dividend that people talked about at the end of the Cold War in, in the late 80s, that you know, this fizzled out and disappeared and, and you know, corporate domination became ever stronger. And then toward the end of the 1990s, the emergence of this new global civil society, which actually goes back uh, both in terms of values and in terms of people, leaders, goes back to the 60s, to the various networks we had in the 60s and 70s. So I've been part of many of these movements. And at the end of the book, in the epilogue, I ask exactly the question you're asking me now. Uh, what about this change of paradigms that I've been analyzing and promoting for five decades? How much of it has happened? Has there actually been a turning point? And my answer is, and, and I have realized this already many years ago, that because of the highly nonlinear nature of society and of now of the global community, if you wish, um, these social changes don't occur on a linear chain. So you can say, here's the old paradigm, here it's changing and now we are in the new paradigm. There are sort of what I call the swings of a chaotic pendulum. There are scientific revolutions, there are grassroots revolutions, there are back swings, there are pendulum swings. And so in the epilogue of the book, I go through these pendulum swings that I, and these movements I just mentioned. And um, then I, I end up um, quoting uh, one of the personalities who was at the very center of these radical changes uh, the Czech uh, former president and uh, playwright Václav Havel. And Havel um, has, uh, in one of his essays, he writes about hope. And, you know, I am often asked, and people like me in the movement are often asked, what do you have hope for the future? And, and so ha Havel has a a brief meditation on the nature of hope. And I want to read this to you. And this is what really has inspired me for the last 20 years. And as you say, has helped me to live my life and to uh, you know, continue my work. So Havel writes, the kind of hope that I often think about, I understand above all as a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. It is a dimension of the soul, and it's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it will turn out. So this is, uh, this is, I have used as you know my guiding spirit, and that has helped me enormously. I, I love that, and because your work makes sense, I think you've probably weathered these storms to answer the question very nicely. I've followed you through this whole crazy time, and you've continued with the courses, you've continued with the lectures. Um, your your first two books, and I don't know if you want to tell us the story. You took the proceeds from your first two books to start the Elmwood um, Institute. Institute, which later evolved to something else, which has been uh, um, a blessing for the world because it's something that we all so much need. Can you tell me, uh, tell yes. us all a little well, bit more the, about that? The story is that uh, when I branched out into all these other fields, biology, psychology, economics, management, I realized very soon that I could not discuss the paradigm shift in those fields without help from others, because I was not an expert in medicine. 
I was not an expert in biology or in psychotherapy or in, in economics. And uh, I couldn't uh, educate myself by reading books uh, because I wouldn't even know where to start. You have this huge library picture of the library in your, in, in, on your screen. So imagine, uh, you know, the, the young Fritjof of Capra standing in the middle and looking at the economics. What section. are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? Where are you going to start? So I developed a technique, and this has stayed with me to the present day, of engaging people in dialogues. First of all, in seeking them out and recognizing them as sharing the same value system and worldview and systemic thinking with me. And secondly, as being experts in their fields. And so I would met them in lectures and seminars and in, 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 on various occasions. And so by the time I wrote the turning point, I had entered into formal relations with several of them like Stan Groff and Margaret Locke and Carl Simonton and Hazel Henderson, uh, who became official advisors to my book project. They wrote position papers for me giving the history of economics or the history of biology and so on, or psychology. And I would then weave these essays into, into my book. And as I was seeking out people, I found that many of them were disappointed with the academic environment, which was too much grounded in the mechanistic worldview, which was too fragmented as it still often is today. And they were either dropping out or had half dropped out. And so I had the idea of assembling several of them and founding uh, a, an ecological think tank, which we called the Elmwood Institute after a neighborhood in Berkeley where I lived at the time. And for 10 years, we organized seminars, we published books, we had all kinds of projects of promoting a systemic and ecological worldview and value system. And then in 1994, uh, yeah, yeah, at the end of 1994, we transformed the Elmwood Institute because it became too much and funding was a major issue. We focused on just one part of it, which is education and schools. And we called it uh, Center for Eco-Literacy. We had an eco-literacy program already in the Elmwood Institute for two years, and then focus on teaching the basic principles of ecology to uh, children in, in public schools. And that, that Center for Eco-Literacy still exists in Berkeley. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And just uh, recently was going to the website and seeing some of the things that they were doing. They're doing a lot around um, food and nature for, for, for youth and, and uh, yes. really tying that in. I, I really love that. There is one thing that I kind of want to ask you, which I, I didn't understand that ties to one of my passions. So I'm, I'm what they call a global food reformist. I really feel that the basic needs in food and nature and agriculture, how we do food is a, a big s solution towards solving human suffering and a lot of the problems that we have. And you, um, you have the, you mentioned, and, and I might've misunderstood it, monastic practice around food. And, and I'm wondering if I understood it correctly. And I'm wondering, I hope I'm not catching you off guard, but I wanted to kind of understand a little bit more what you meant by these monastic practices around food. And that there's something that's been around for a, a lot of way, but it's a different way of viewing and dealing with it. Well, it, this actually came out of a conversation I had with the economist Hazel Henderson or the, the radical alternative economist and futurist Hazel Henderson. And I, <clears throat> I had this conversation with her in the late 1970s, you know, long before the Center for Eco-Literacy. And what we were talking about 
is uh, there are two kinds of work that we can distinguish that people do. One is work of building something that will last of, you know, having a big skyscraper or, you know, a company that will last for a long time or, you know, having some, some kind of lasting structure, either material. Almost like a monument or something. A as monument, well. yeah. yeah. Could, could also be an intellectual monument. Yeah. The other yeah. work is what I call cyclical work. Work that is done and has to be redone all the time. So you cook a meal, you eat it, and it's gone, and you have to cook again. You know, you wash the dishes and they're dirty again. Uh, you, you, you grow, you harvest food, you know, it grows, it matures, and then uh, you plant it, it grows, it matures, you harvest it, you know, it decays, you plant again. And so this cyclical work is work that is very closely connected to life because life is cyclical and is ever changing. Uh, this is why I love, just as a sideline, I love the uh, sculptor Andy Goldsworthy so much, whose iconic picture is, is on, on uh, the textbook, The Systems View of Life. His sculptures are all ephemeral because he intuits the dynamic and ever-changing nature of, uh, uh, of life. Now, when you are really in tune with life, this is a kind of a spiritual connection. And you can see this in the monasteries. And I come to the monastic activities. Many traditional monasteries, like the Benedictines, for instance, they had you know, agricultural enterprises. Uh, they, they, they were, um, uh, they had wine cellars, they, they were cultivating wine, they were growing food. Um, and and uh, the, the kind of cyclical work puts us in touch with nature and, and a deep appreciation of the cyclical nature is ultimately a spiritual experience. And so this is why there's this monastic dimension to the cyclical work. So to come back to the Center for Eco-Literacy, what we did was to develop a pedagogy where children would learn the basic principles of ecology, the basic concepts like networks, cycles, flows, diversity, and so on. They would learn them out in the garden, you know, gardening, uh, growing food, and then cooking food in the kitchen. So that was the basic approach. Wow. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. And the, the system view of life, the book you just held up, you did with Pierre Luigi. Pierre Luigi. Luigi. Pierre Luigi. And uh, I, I recently also heard a story, and uh, I'd like you to tell it, which somehow ties me to Lynn Margulis again, or some of my other feelings or thoughts on primordial soup, that Pierre Luigi actually at one point in time recreated this uh, primordial soup, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know, experiments the wrong word, but no, 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 it's it, there are experiments. Okay. He is a biochemist and he spent 30 years at the Swiss University in Zurich, which is called ETH after the German, oh, you know, Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule. Yeah, genau. It means uh, Swiss Polytechnic, basically. Yeah. And uh, uh, Luisi, his last name is Luisi. And Luigi. his friends call him Luigi, so it's a little confusing. So, so Luigi spent 30 years um, developing uh, chemical systems that are small bubbles, which have networks inside, chemical networks <coughs> that are prototypes for living networks and which have uh, you know, prototypes of membranes. So they're not alive, but they're sort of the step before life emerges. 
And so he's one of the world experts on the origin of life. And this is one of his main contributions to the book. Uh, in addition to a lot of biochemistry, genetics, theory of evolution, and, and so on. When I, when I look, so Lynn, Lynn Margulis, her first husband, uh, her <laughs> husband, uh, uh, before they got divorced, was Carl Sagan, who also did the cosmos. But he always said, we are all star stuff. And this whole thing that, you know, the earth started with star stuff and basic elements and bacteria and, and that. And then what, what I hear about Pier Luigi, uh, Louise, Luigi, um, that really is, is so interesting, this, this, um, how this web, this systems view of seeing different experts, scientists, people who are for researching and studying <laughs> how they all come together to kind of formulate this bigger picture of, and I always struggle with the words, the, the true reality of how life really is, you know, and how, well, how it's developed well, and how know, it the, works. The story of the origin of life is really fascinating and also very frustrating. Uh, today, uh, there is a widely shared belief among scientists that evolution started long before the emergence of life, that there was a molecular evolution, or it's also called prebiotic evolution, where molecular structures became ever more complicated. There were protocells, tiny bubbles with chemical structures that uh, put into uh, place into motion a kind of Darwinian competition that they were different, they were very diverse, and some survived longer and others couldn't survive. And <clears throat> eventually, the living cell emerged out of those protocells, and uh, natural selection operated in such a way that those structures which could not survive in the long run didn't leave any traces, they are gone. And so the most effective, the fittest, if you wish, to survive are the cells, the bacteria that evolved 3.6 billion years ago and the others are gone. And so Luisi and his colleagues tried desperately to recreate this pathway of molecular evolution, but they had nothing in nature, no traces, no hints about how things might have evolved. So it's a very difficult, but at the same time, very exciting subject. You have so much wisdom and knowledge in these stories, and I'm so glad that you're open and share it with, with all of us. How, um, so we mentioned in the beginning, I'm an alumni of the Systems View of Life Capra course, and it was absolutely fabulous. I've, I've referred probably 16, 17 or more people to it who have all gone through since and, and have been enamored for it. But regardless of how much I talk about systems, the Systems View of Life and, and that, some people just as Germans say, stay off from Schlauch, ich verstehe nur Bahnhof. They just don't understand when you say systems or systems view of life, they system yeah. like a government or computer system. Um, can, you have the most eloquent way kind of uh, describing it and, and helping us uh, understand okay. it. Mark, you're bringing up two subjects. One is the online course that I've been teaching now for six years. And let me tell you the story of the Capra course. <clears throat> so the, the book, The Systems View of Life was published in 2014. And Luigi and I went around in various places in Europe and the United States to promote it as one does with a new book. And I got several invitations to give talks at various universities. The book is published by University of Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. And, uh, you know, one of these universities 
uh, there were a group of faculty who met with me about maybe 15 people who had all read the book and the book had just come out. So I was very impressed. There were all these professors who had read the book already. And uh, they told me it would be very difficult for them to use it as a textbook. And so I was sort of, uh, you know, shocked by that, you know, why it was written as a textbook, why can't it be used as a textbook? Well, the reason is that systems thinking and the systems view is inherently multidisciplinary. And so we touch on all these dimensions of life, the biological, the cognitive, the social, the ecological, and we integrate them into a synthesis. And so these professors told me, one said, look, I'm a biologist and I cannot teach about the nature of consciousness. You know, I know nothing about that. So then the psychologist said, well, I'm a psychologist. I can talk about the nature of consciousness, but I cannot teach about economics or management. And so it went on. So they suggested to publish a shorter, simpler version that they could use for a course. And we didn't want to do that because we thought we would lose the substance of the book uh, by simplifying it. But I did something else. I created a model course. And so this was the origin of the Capra course, <clears throat> which is a course about the systems view of life. And it is structured in terms of 12 lectures each about 40 minutes long, one lecture per week. And then the course also features a discussion forum in which I participate every week, you know, posting answers to questions from students and, and discussing things with them. And this has been, I'm happy to say, very successful. We run the course twice a year in the spring and in the fall. The fall course just started two weeks ago. They actually, we are going to keep registration open for another week, but uh, we are almost full. We have 225 or so students in the course. And uh, after this, after these six years now, the systems view of life is being taught in universities courses with our book as textbook. So I was successful in uh, presenting a model course that can actually be used in universities and should be used. I absolutely love it. And, and a lot of the, um, the mm -hmm. students, I mean, the, stu the students that you have, and you, you mentioned this in one of your, your, your videos and discussions, they're from all over the world, all walks of life, all at different ages, and it's really, from the highest academic levels to just uh, this, the simple person who wants to get Absolutely. this Absolutely, and now we have also study groups that are held by alumni, led by alumni, and which, which are organized in different languages. So we have a German study group in German, one in Italian, one in Spanish, one in Portuguese, and, and so on for Brazil and so on. But I want to come back to your other question when people don't understand systems. And this is a problem because uh, system is a sort of dry word, you know, which is not, not very attractive. This is why I always, I always talk about living systems or regenerative systems or, you know, ecosystems to, to uh, make it less dry and abstract. But it is <clears throat> the scientific term that is used as a common denominator for living organisms, social networks, ecosystems. So we talk about ecosystems, social systems, and individual organisms. There's a lot of discussion as well on, on patterns. Um, and oh, uh, talking about systems. Yeah, and systems. Yeah. Let me let me tell you a funny anecdote. Uh, uh, you mentioned before that people say, "Well, do you meet the political system?" You know, yeah. this is a very well known sense of the word system. The system, you know, and 
activists and revolutionaries are against the system, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I had to deal with that and with this language problem. But once in San Francisco in the 1990s, I met Mikhail Gorbachev, whom I admired very much. And so I had a chance at the reception to speak five minutes or 10 minutes with him. And I told him that I'm teaching systems thinking and the systems view of the world. And I'm writing about that. At that time, I hadn't written the textbook with Luigi. And so I have books about like the web of life. I was working on that. It's a book about living systems and I teach systems thinking. And Gorbachev said, well, I don't like systems, but systems thinking is okay, I guess. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and that, there's a big sec patterns of connection. There's a, you know, the end section is on um, Gorbachev as well. Chapter four is one of the most amazing chapters that I really liked a, a, a lot in the book. Um, I, I, I want to touch on a couple other things. So I mentioned it in the beginning that regeneration is kind of the big buzzword everybody's using right. it regenerative agriculture regenerative village eco villages regeneration this and regeneration that but it's actually pretty old uh i think there's some ties to uh, uh, and i always say this wrong as well autopoiesis yes well let me let me tell you that one of the first scientists who recognized the importance of regeneration for understanding life. Guess who that was? I'm not even gonna guess. It was, but... it was Leonardo da Vinci oh. in the Italian Renaissance. <clears throat> I, could have known. I wrote two books about Leonardo and one I have, I have here, which is called Learning from Leonardo. And in this book, I uh, discuss Leonardo's view of the earth as a living system, which at his time was common, and it's close to our modern Gaia theory. But it was the view of uh, the earth goddess and the, the earth of being alive and mother earth was uh, mythical and metaphorical. And Leonardo turned it into a scientific uh, hypothesis. And this is how he argued. He said, look, we see that trees lose their leaves every fall and they renew themselves. That was the word he used for regeneration. They renew themselves every spring. Grasses die in the winter and renew themselves every spring when the season changes. The, the, the skin, the hair on animals falls out and renews itself again. So wherever we look in nature, we see this constant regeneration and renewal. And this is why we can say the earth is a living organism. So that was his argument. And then he compared you know, the, the oceans to the blood and the rocks to the bones and so on. And some of these comparisons are not very good. And some of them he changed as he went along going into more detail. But he was the first to really recognize regeneration as, as the essence of life. And then the most advanced theory uh, we have today, as you said, is the theory of autopoiesis, which means self-making and it's a theory developed by Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela where they say that the defining characteristic of life is <clears throat> that it is a self-organizing network. Every living system is a network. It organizes itself <clears throat> and the very essence of this self-organization is a self-generation. The network continually generates and regenerates itself. So in the cell, for example, all the structures you see 
the proteins, enzymes, the membranes, the RNA, the DNA, all these molecular structures are continually created, maintained, transformed and replaced by the cellular network. So there's continual regeneration. And, and that is the important thing the systems view of life brings to that. It puts re regeneration at the very outset of biological life. The very definition of biological life is regeneration. Autopoiesis is a complex Greek term that Maturana and Varela invented because in science, when you want to make a mark, the best thing to do is to invent a term, you know, and then it's, it's always your term. So, so I called it autopoiesis or self-making, but regeneration is a simpler and I think more, much more evocative term, except maybe for Greeks, autopoiesis is also evocative, but for yeah, us, yeah. it's a foreign yeah. term. But so that's why regeneration is so important. And it, and it all it all ties to not only the book that we've been talking about, but the systems view of life, the course, the way that the direction that we're moving in to solve some of our civilization frameworks, the way that we live, the way we see our world, the kind of the new the new operating systems or models that we use um uh to for success for the future i i say a lot in, in discussions that i have that there's been more than 20 civilization frameworks in our world uh before that have all collapsed that don't exist anymore early antiquity incas aztecs mayas on and on and the majority of them collapse because of ecological or environmental collapse, a lot uh, to do with food and, and, and things like that. Um, but, but what we're learning, or well, at least what I've learned, and, and I want to get your viewpoints on, on, and feelings on this, is that not only did they collapse because of this, this lack of environmental, ecological, um, regeneration a, a framework to keep the whole system the whole uh thing moving even though they were advanced civilizations they had infrastructure they had you know all sorts of things that that could keep them going that they failed but that we're seeing also in those civilization collapse that there are patterns or networks that were all very hierarchical and Hannah Arndt, I don't know if you've read any of uh, her works, you know, Hannah yeah. Arndt, um, the Eichmann trials or Hannah Arndt's The, yeah. the Human Condition. Um, she kind of touches on that and talks about it that, you know, some sometimes the way our systems, our organization is set up is very neo-Darwinism. It's very neoliberalism. The people at the bottom of these hierarchies are peasants and slaves and laborers and farmers. And um, even today in, in, in our, our political systems and models, is it because we're not grasping that there's some better frameworks or better models out there like autopoiesis or regenerative frameworks or the systems frameworks that are we're just repeating the same mistakes oh. over and over again. Well, it's it's interesting with the systems view of life <clears throat> that is so-called uneducated people have a much better grasp of the systems view of life because they're closer to nature and they have not been uh, spoiled or brainwashed by the mechanistic science that we have developed which has been very successful, but then we went too far, you know, and became too mechanistic, too fragmented. <clears throat> and so you often see that uh, indigenous cultures have worldviews that are very close to the system's view of life. Uh, there's this famous Native American saying where they speak about nature as all my relations, you know, well, that's a systemic statement, you know, it's systems view, all my relations. And of course, uh, 
the the living beings in our environment are literally our relations genetically. That's what Darwinism is all about. That's what evolution is all about. So, you know, people without academic education <coughs> are often much closer to the system's view of life. And uh, the other thing I would say, and this is also something that Hannah Arendt writes about, the reason why um, civilizations often decline is that uh, we are not playing with our full deck of cards because most of our social institutions are uh, you know, led by men and occupied by, by men and women have played a secondary role. Now, of course, this is changing now. And, and you know, many governments, especially in Europe, uh, have you know parliaments and governments that are you know 50 or almost 50 percent women and it's going to continue to change but uh, you know the influence of patriarchy has has been tremendous and we're just overcoming it now we, we're almost out of time so, but <clears throat> I have four yeah. questions if we can do them quickly I'd, I'd like to to go through them um the, the, the main one is, and you've given us a wonderful, more than a teaser of the book and of the system's view of life and of the course and kind of some thoughts and many of the, the other things we, we speak about. But I always ask my guests um, this, this one question, and I formulate it in two different ways, and I, I want to <clears> ask it to you. It's really, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, uh, a world that works for everyone would be a world designed according to ecological principles, because it is the very nature of ecosystems that everybody participates, everybody is evolved, involved, everybody cooperates, everybody networks. So this wisdom of nature is, you know, millions and billions of years old. And the best we can do to create a truly sustainable world that works for everyone and works in the long run is to follow this wisdom of nature uh, and to uh, design our uh, social structures and technologies and physical structures according to the principles of ecology that nature has evolved. The, the last question <laughs> I have are, for, are really for my listeners and they're ones that um, would kind of give them something of inspiration or help. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that really had the power to change their life or shift that paradigm, what would it be your, your message? Okay, uh, well, following on what I just said now to design and redesign our world according to ecological principles, when you study these principles in detail, like the cycles of nature, diversity, networking, and so on. Solar energy is the energy source. When you study them in detail, you will find that you can summarize these principles by saying nature sustains life by creating and nurturing communities. That's what it all amounts to. And so the community of life is the essential image. And if we want to live sustainably, the best thing what we can do is to create and nurture communities. Love that. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Mark. That was very inspiring and very enjoyable. Thank you. We could talk for hours. And I really appreciate you letting us inside of your ideas. And <clears throat> I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. Thank you.